Hi, Cinematic Enthuse here. Today is March 7th. Yep, March 7th, 2024. And um, just uh, wanted to talk a little bit today about some movies you might have seen me post um, because I'm just getting started with these accounts on YouTube and Instagram. Um, I may go on TikTok, TikTok at some point, but right now I'm posting on YouTube as as you're seeing right now and what I'm doing is I'm just basically leaving links to movies that I can do that safely uh, so you can watch them and I can let you know ahead of time on Instagram what I'm watching and then I'll do like a little blurb about it like I'm doing right now so just to let you know sort of what I'm doing and what I might do down the road is like talk about some lists of screwball comedies that we can look at and maybe you guys can choose some for me to watch and we can, you know, give you guys some audience participation that way. Um, let me see how that goes. Um, but that might be a possibility. But this week I just was able to get in a few more videos than normal. I don't know if I'll be able to put out this many every week, but um, just kind of an abundant week, so why not? Uh, it's odd that I chose two films this week, both from 1933. One I've seen before several times, the other one I've never seen before. Um, and then I also wanted to talk a little bit of music too at the end, so. But the films, the first one I saw was Footlight Parade, which many of you might be familiar with. Um, it's really, it's a musical comedy um, I'd say it's a musical. It's the, the musicals of the 30s are so singularly unique because they just look, they look and sound different than even the 50s musicals or the 40s musicals, in my opinion. Um, this one in particular, I think everybody knows it because of Busby Berkeley, the, uh, He's a director, but he's really he was really a choreographer, and um, of course his famous kaleidoscopic, um, intensely intricate and precision choreography uh, with like hundreds and hundreds of ladies, kind of moving in a clock clockwise motion or in a kaleidoscopic motion. Uh, it's it's always fabulous to watch. Um, I can't imagine how painstaking it would be to actually be a performer in one of his uh, numbers. I'm sure it would be really hard. Uh, I've heard he was a, I think there's been books written about him being a horrible taskmaster, which, you know, you hear that about a lot of people from that time. But anyway, it's fabulous to watch and there's some really great numbers. I love the Buy, buy a Waterfall is a wonderful number to watch. That's towards the end. And there's a couple other famous ones. Um, you might have seen people talking about the Cats number because it was like the first time Cats, like people wearing kitten costumes were on film. And so when the movie Cats came out last, I don't know if that was two years ago, 2022 or 2023, a lot of people were referencing the number from Footlight Parade from 1933 and saying, let's watch this Cats instead, <laughs> which I thought was cute. Um, I never did see the Cats from um, the remake of the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical that they did again. Well, they did it on film for the first time, I guess. But so, but Full Light Parade is awesome because of, in my opinion, because of, well, four people in terms of acting. Jimmy Cagney, Joan Blondell, Frank McHugh and Ruby Keeler. I can take or leave Dick Powell. I mean, he's he's great in this, but um, Ruby Keeler is wonderful. Uh, she's a great dancer. She's very appealing as the ingenue type. And Joan Blondell is just like a star in this. I love Joan Blondell in this movie and I love her and Jimmy together, like I could have used like 10 more of these movies. I know they did another movie together called um, Blonde Crazy, and that's a good movie, but it's not the same tone, is it? It's a, it's a very good movie, you should watch it. Uh, maybe I'll watch it again and we can, you know, I can review it here. 
but it's a different tone. It doesn't really have a, um, it's a little more serious than this movie is. Uh, this movie is definitely a comedy. Um, it's definitely got that fast talking, rat-a-tat, clever, witty banter that you would associate, even if it, it's, I would put it under a screwball comedy type movie for sure. Um, even if it has musical numbers in it, because I think there's a lot of stuff from pretty much the entire decade of the 30s. There's so much either slapstick or screwball. It's so hard to like differentiate between the two because the 30s were just so full of that, especially if it was a comedy. So um, as you move on after the 30s, it becomes a little bit harder to, or maybe it becomes easier to delineate between the two because things were a little more structured, but in the thirties, everything's kind of packed together, which is great. So, um, cinematography wise, you're going to get some great stuff because of Busby Berkeley. Um, uh, although he is not the cinematographer, that's George Barnes, but I mean, still with, with such, you know, Lloyd Bacon is pretty awesome at musicals and he does a lot of, um, he did a lot of, um, vaudeville too so that whenever you have a vaudeville person involved especially if they're like a director or the main uh starring actor you're always going to get this really quick quick-witted kind of banter and usually some you know physical comedy and stuff like that um and oh yeah you might know lloyd bacon the director from 42nd street so um he because he directed that as well so that's, that's kind of, I think his other big, and I think he's done some other musicals besides that. He might've done some of the, um, Gold Diggers or some of the, uh, other, I'm not a hundred percent about that. I'll have to check back. But anyway, so Jimmy Cagney's wonderful as Chester Kent. And I love Jimmy Cagney as a song and dance man. And I even read somewhere that he really enjoyed, and of course everybody knows him from Yankee Doodle Dandy. But, and that's later, that's in the 40s. But in the 30s, he did, you know, this musical and he did at least two or three more that I don't think are as great. Um, they're not as well known. I think this is probably his finest 1930s musical. And it really shows him off as a song and dance man. I mean, I don't think he, I think he gets to sing at the end, but he's, you'll get to see him dance plenty. Um, and of course he and Joan together are just wonderful. So, I mean, they would have been, there could have been a whole series of movies with just the two of them. Plus, I think they were good friends in real life. So, that's a definite plus, and I will attach links, or a link to that in the comments of YouTube here. And then the other movie I saw, which I had never seen all the way through, I think I had started it once and I just kind of lost track of it, is called By Candlelight. And this is one of those short, you know how they have these movies, I think they're called like B-movies, where they usually run for like anywhere from 65 minutes to like 75 minutes. They're not quite an hour and a half, they're not quite 90 minutes. But I like those kinds of movies. They're, it's kind of like watching an episode of, you know, a TV show or something, only a little bit longer, or a, you know, a, like a mini series type thing. This one took a little bit of time for me to get into. It's um, it's a comedy, but it's kind of like a sophisticated comedy that you would associate with Ernst Lubitsch. And of course, we'll do some Lubitsch. Lubitsch is wonderful. Um, but this is very much like in the style of Lubitsch. There, you've got aristocrats and, well, one in particular. And then you have his servant. And that's the main character. Paul Lucas plays him, the, the servant. And the servant wants to be the aristocrat, and he pretends to be the aristocrat, and then he meets this young lady. And spoiler alert, although you'll figure this out in the first, like, 30 minutes of the movie, so it's not, like, a huge surprise, and plus it's part of the description, that the he thinks the young lady he's meeting is another aristocrat, but she herself is a maid as well. So we know about halfway through the movie that they're both servants, which I think makes it very sweet. 
But beyond that storyline, and there's some other things that happen in the storyline, but beyond that storyline, what I think this movie is really worth watching for, they're both delightful, okay? I wouldn't say they're, they're not top par. This is not a, like, you know, grade A movie. This is one of those movies where if you have nothing better to do and you want to kind of relax and have something fun, it's entertaining. But here's what I think is really awesome about this movie is the cinematography is killer. Absolutely awesome. And I was so wowed by it. I was like, I had to look it up while I was watching. I was like, who is this? Because it's outstanding. Well, it turns out the, uh, the director is James Whale. And James Whale, all you horror fans know him from Frankenstein, right? And then his, I'm looking up the cinematographer, I guess was somebody he worked with a lot named John J. Mescal. And absolutely, well, and go figure, John J. Mescal worked with Ernst Lubitsch on The Silence. And that's what I really think comes across in this. There's like one scene in particular I'm thinking of. Uh, so keep a lookout for this scene where the two main characters, uh, Elisa Landi and Paul Lucas, are in a corridor. And you can see the light coming in from the side and the silhouettes with the shadows of black and white of things of light coming in through the room. You'll know the scene when I'm talking, you know, when you see it. It's just keep an eye out for the cinematography in this movie. It almost steals the show beyond the actors <laughs> um, and makes it worth it, you know. So even if you're like bored out of your mind, which I wasn't bored out of my mind, I've seen way worse than this. Um, it was, that's why I kind of, when I reviewed it in, I haven't given it a proper review, but I just rated it in my Letterboxd account. Um, I gave it about two and a half stars, but if I was going with the cinematography, I should probably give it three stars, you know, because it's pretty awesome. And they are charming, you know, the characters are charming, and it has a wonderful ending, and if you love Lubitsch, you'll like it, because... It's got his kind of feel to it. And you can tell James Whale was probably a huge fan. And since he had the cinematographer who worked with Lubitsch, you know, that's an added bonus. So those are two things. And I will put the link for that. That's a YouTube as well. And luckily the, the, the link that I'm sharing with you is somebody's uh, Blu-ray uh, high definition cut. So you'll get to see. It's pretty clear. It's pretty crisp for YouTube. I mean, when we get lucky with links, we get lucky, right? Also, the link for Footlight Parade is, is very good, too. Um, that's a Vimeo link. And so I'm trying to do that as long as I can, give you guys links. Um, then the other thing I wanted to tell you is, speaking of Letterboxd, the reason I brought up Letterboxd is, some of you might already know what it is, but if you don't, if you're interested in signing up for it, it's just a, it's just an app, you know, it's for film, you know, lists, basically. And so you can either review films you're watching, log them in, rate them. You can categorize them into, like, lists if you want. The reason I'm bringing it up is I've got my Letterboxd account uh, set up so that if you go to it, you can see different kinds of screwball comedies. You can see, like, the main ones that I see over and over. Those are, like, the really famous ones. Then you'll see other movies I saw in certain years that are screwball comedies. I have a list of musicals um, that, I, that I've seen several times. Then I have another list of musicals that are newer to me. Uh, not new, but new to me. Um, and then I have another list that's like um, more modern, like when I say modern, I mean like 80s, 1980s, 1990s, maybe early 2000s of more recent comedies that harken back to the time of screwball comedy and there's a ton more lists I have too about other things like cinematography I have a couple drama lists I have some foreign film lists um, so if you're just looking for something to watch and I may draw from some of these lists as well for ideas that's where I'm kind of getting this from in music news, this doesn't happen every day. I just heard this on the radio from, uh, I think it was NPR, said that James Brown, they found a new uh, vault 
uh, song from James Brown. I guess they decided to release it. Uh, I think it's from 1970 that they said. Uh, it's called We've Got to Change. And I'm, I can't seem to find the lyrics yet because it's probably not, you know, out in all the databases, but I really liked what I heard. Uh, it reminded me of, uh, if you're familiar with James Brown, uh, that song Soul Power with it, where he and Bobby, uh, Bobby Bird would kind of go back and forth. It was, it's not a duet, but they kind of sing back and forth to each other. Um, it's definitely in that period of, um, you know, social change, kind of the, the kinds of social change songs he was doing at that time, uh, which he did for years, uh, especially in the 70s. So it's got that feel, and I really liked it. It was very cool. And it made me want to either pull out my James Brown playlist and post that for you guys or make a new one. Um, I told you I was going to at some point talk about music. I do have several playlists that I've already made over the years, um, but I know it's Women's History Month this month. So what I might do down the road <clears throat> uh, in the next few days or in the next week is maybe do a video about um, either some music or some actors, uh, prominent women, that sort of thing, since it's March. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off for now, and I'll leave those links for you for Footlight Parade um, by Candlelight. And uh, I hope you enjoy them. And let me know if you have any suggestions or questions or comments. All right, thanks.